Committee. Salima Shivji has the details. This is the House of Commons Ethics Committee really beginning its deep dive into how We Charity was put in charge of the $900 million student grant program. One of several committee investigations, the goal here is to review the safeguards in place to avoid conflicts of interest when it comes to federal spending. And along with the Youth and Employment Ministers and the Clerk of the Privy Council, the committee will also hear today from Mary Dawson, the former Ethics Commissioner who ruled the Prime Minister violated the Conflict of Interest Act when he visited the Aga Khan's private island in the Bahamas. The first ethics violation for Justin Trudeau, but not the last, for a Prime Minister who is facing yet another ethics investigation, this time over the WE contract. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Russia's health ministry has given the green light for what could be the world's first COVID-19 vaccine. It was developed by a Moscow-based institute. The regulatory approval comes before phase three trials, which normally last several months and involves thousands of people. President Vladimir Putin says his daughter has already been inoculated and he hopes mass production will start soon. But testing for safety and efficacy is still underway. Critics say Russia is rushing the process, putting national prestige before science and safety. Meanwhile, four people in New Zealand have been confirmed to have COVID-19. The news comes after 102 days without any domestic transmission of the virus in the country. Lockdown restrictions will be put on Auckland for the next three days. The rest of the country will move to a level two restriction, which limits the size of gatherings. There is more violence in Belarus today over the presidential election. <laughs> one protester is dead. The country's interior ministry claims the victim was attempting to throw an explosive device when it blew up. The president of Belarus says the protesters are under what he calls, quote, foreign control. The opposition is leading the demonstrations, denouncing the vote that gave the president a sixth consecutive term as rigged. At least 3,000 people have been taken into custody. Meanwhile, the top opposition candidate has fled to Lithuania. A Minneapolis judge has released body camera footage of two police officers involved in George Floyd's death. Floyd's killing in May sparked international protests against anti-black racism and police brutality. Senior Washington editor Lindsay Duncombe has more on what the videos show. The body cam video from Officer Thomas Lane shows the beginning of the encounter with Floyd. Lane uses a stick to tap the window of a vehicle and Floyd is in the driver's seat. Officer Lane has a gun pointed at Floyd. It appears he pointed that weapon 14 seconds after tapping on the window. Floyd is agitated. Throughout the encounter, he is crying, apologizing, and telling police he is claustrophobic. The videos show the moments before Floyd is pinned to the ground. That happens after Floyd is in handcuffs and resists getting into the back of a police car. You do hear Officer Thomas Lane ask Derek Chauvin to twice if Floyd should be moved, and Lane's lawyers are expected to use that to defend their client. The video also shows what happens after the ambulance arrives. It takes close to three minutes before medical personnel tell officers to begin performing CPR. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. And that is your world this hour. You can listen to us live on your mobile device using the CBC Listen app or anytime on voice-activated devices like Amazon Echo or Google Home. For CBC News, I'm Idil Musa. From CTV News at 9.58 a.m. today, Hello, I'm Marcia McMillan from the CTV Newsroom in Toronto. Here are the top stories. Canada's youth minister appears before the Commons Ethics Committee's probe of the WE Affair today. Bartis Shager has already testified it was the civil services idea to award WE a nearly billion dollar contract. 
Police body cam footage shows Minneapolis officers arresting George Floyd has been released to the public. The footage shows Floyd pleading with the officers as they struggle to place him in a squad car in the minutes before his death, May 25th. Russia becomes the first country to approve a vaccine for COVID-19. President Putin says one of his daughters has been vaccinated. Despite international concern, the vaccine is being used before phase three trials are conducted. The number of coronavirus cases in Brandon, Manitoba is rising. A third of those infected, 22 cases, are working at one meat plant. Now there's a total of 64 cases in the city's cluster. The Toronto Blue Jays are getting set to play their first home game at the revamped stadium in Buffalo, where they will face the Miami Marlins today. Some of the upgrades include expanded locker rooms to handle physical distancing. For the day's top stories and breaking news as it happens, tune to CTV News Channel or go online to ctvnews.ca. I'm Marcia McMillan. From CNBC Tech Check at 3.55 p.m. yesterday. I'm Kate Rooney, and here's your CNBC Tech Check. Amazon and mall operator Simon Property are said to be working on a plan. That's to turn former department stores into Amazon fulfillment centers. The Wall Street Journal says the talks are focusing on space formerly occupied by JCPenney and Sears stores. Having more fulfillment centers in these spaces near residential areas could speed up the critical, quote, last mile of delivery. JCPenney filed for bankruptcy in May and is closing 154 stores this summer. Sears said last year that it was closing 96 more stores. Meanwhile, a potential suitor has emerged in the TikTok sweepstakes. Twitter is reportedly interested in buying the company's U.S. operations. That's according to the Wall Street Journal, citing people familiar with the matter. Microsoft has already confirmed it's in talks to buy the popular video sharing app and is still seen as the front runner in a deal if it can be put together. Finally, Uber CEO is pushing for, quote, a third way to classify workers in the gig economy. In a New York Times op-ed, Dara Khosrowshahi argues companies that rely on gig workers should be required to create benefit funds that can be used by workers for anything from health insurance to paid time off. The op-ed comes as Uber contests a lawsuit from California's attorney general, which claims the ride-sharing giant denied its drivers benefits by misclassifying them as independent contractors. And that's it from the West Coast. We'll see you back here tomorrow. From DW News Brief at midnight today. This is DW News and these are our top stories. Lebanese Prime Minister Hassan Diab has announced the resignation of his government after last week's massive blast in Beirut. The cabinet quit amid unrest over official corruption and negligence, which protesters say made last week's blast possible. As Diab spoke, clashes continued on the streets outside parliament. The Belarusian Interior Ministry says a protester has died during clashes with police after an explosive device blew up in his hands. The victim was part of a crowd protesting the results of Sunday's landslide victory for President Alexander Lukashenko. The election commission said he took 80% of the vote. Hong Kong pro-democracy activist Agnes Cho has become the latest public figure to be arrested under China's new national security law for the territory. She was arrested just hours after police detained media tycoon Jimmy Lai in a raid on his newspaper Apple Daily. The publication said Hong Kong's press freedom was now hanging by a thread. This is DW News from Berlin. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DW News or visit our website DW.com. From Bloomberg First Word at 6.15 a.m. today. President Trump says he's seriously considering a capital gains tax cut. He told reporters it would create a lot more jobs. The president can't cut taxes on his own, but some advisors say he could issue an executive order that adjusts the original purchase price of an asset when it is sold, so no tax is paid on appreciation for inflation. The Trump administration reportedly may temporarily prevent citizens from returning to the U.S. if there's a chance they have the coronavirus. According to the New York Times, the ban would apply to permanent residents too. Federal agencies have been asked for feedback on that proposal. 
And in Seattle, the police chief has resigned after the city council voted to eliminate 100 officers and cut the department's budget. It's the latest move by a local government to cut police funding in the wake of protests over police killings of black people. Seattle's mayor warns that cuts would jeopardize public safety. And in the UK, employment in the second quarter fell by the most since the financial crisis. The number of Britons with jobs declined by 220,000. That was the period when the coronavirus lockdown restrictions were most severe. It's likely matters could get worse. The British government will start gradually withdrawing its support for wages starting this month. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. President Donald J. Trump spent the weekend at a golf course in New Jersey, but that didn't stop him from trying to solve some of the nation's most pressing problems, namely the fact that Congress still hasn't come to an agreement on coronavirus relief. Lee Zo, you've been covering that effort for Vox. It looks like the president had a very busy weekend. He did. He is trying to show people that he can get something done while Congress is deadlocked on stimulus. And he ended up issuing four executive measures in an attempt to address this issue. And that's very confusing right off the jump because the president doesn't control the purse strings of this country, correct? Correct. That's already prompted a ton of confusion ever since he made the announcement. Well, I guess it's still important, though, because the president. So let's talk about what he did. What are in these four executive measures and why are there four of them? There are four because he's trying to address some of the major areas that have been brought up as key points people would like to see more money on. So the four subjects that they touch on are extending enhanced unemployment insurance, some type of support for evictions, uh, deferring payroll taxes, and um, continuing a suspension of student loan payments. Okay, so the president addresses this, um, you know, expanded unemployment insurance, um, eviction moratoriums, payroll tax, student loans. Is there anything he missed? There's a lot that's missing, um, including no second round of stimulus payments, no additional funding for small businesses, and no additional money for state and local governments or schools. And those are some pretty big misses. These are all huge priorities for people as the economy tries to recover from the pandemic and as places like schools try to reopen this fall. All right. Well, within these four executive measures addressing these four things that people really care about, how good a job is the president doing of, you know, delivering the goods? He is unfortunately not doing such a great job. In several of the cases, actually three out of the four, it actually seems like people won't really see any clear effects for quite a while. In the first case, um, for extending enhanced unemployment insurance, the goal is to continue to give people an extra $400 a week via this executive order. So that's 400 instead of the earlier 600? That's correct. Um, the problem with how he's implemented it is that $100 of the 400 is something he'd like states to chip in for, which is something that many places just don't have the money to do at this point. And additionally, he wants to set up a new system to put out these payments to people. And that alone is set to take months to actually complete. So people wouldn't be seeing these unemployment benefits for a long time. Hmm. So it's going to take a while to get the money. And on top of that, he wants states to chip in for about a fourth of it. Did he consult the states on that before making this call? It definitely doesn't seem like he did because many have already pushed back and said they won't be able to handle this additional cost as they struggle to cover um, current public health um, needs and as their tax revenues have gone down during the pandemic. So not a great outlook on that one. What about the other ones? In the other cases, we see some similar issues. For example, he's framed the executive order focusing on evictions as similar to the eviction moratorium that happened earlier this year in the CARES Act, when it actually is not. 
what the memo that he put out actually does is it simply asks HHS and the CDC to consider extending a ban, um, and it asks other federal agencies to look for money to help people with evictions. So it's really just the first step in getting anything done, um, but does it promise anything concrete at this moment? Not the best news for people expecting help from the government, not the best news for people expecting some sort of ban on evictions from the government. What else? One of his chief goals so far has been to implement some kind of payroll tax cut. And this time around, he has tried to institute a holiday which would defer payroll taxes for people making under $104,000 a year um, until after the end of this year. And the goal of that is for people in that income bracket to basically see an income boost in that time. But again, that's not expected to happen because since this is just a deferral, many companies might continue to withhold the same taxes that they have because they'll end up having to pay them anyway after the year's over. Hmm. Okay, so that covers three. We got the uh, direct aid to people. We got the eviction moratorium, payroll tax. What about the fourth one, the one about student loans? So that's the only one that's actually seen as relatively effective. It continues what was set up earlier this year in the CARES Act. It suspends the interest on student loans that are backed by the federal government, and it suspends payments through the end of this year. Well, I'm sure a lot of people will at least really appreciate that. Why go through all the effort to just, like, whiff on the other three? I think, like what we've seen with Trump in the past, he really wants to show people that he's doing something, but the substance of the policy he's proposing doesn't necessarily always match up with those goals. How do his fellow party members feel about it? What are the Republicans saying? It's a mixed reaction from Republicans. You have some that have responded with your typical political response of the president is doing something when Democrats have failed, and that's the message that they want to keep on repeating over and over. On the other hand, you do have some Republicans, like Ben Sass, for example, who are really concerned with the constitutional implications of what he's doing. And what about the Democrats? I imagine they're not big fans. Yep, they are not fans of this for a couple of reasons. They think what he's doing doesn't really cover the full needs of what people require at this time and have called his proposal half-baked and narrow. It doesn't do anything. It is the American people look at these executive orders. They'll see they don't come close to doing the job. And then also, much like some of the Republicans, they're concerned, too, about the constitutional implications here. As in, is any of this legal? Right. And that is something that Trump himself has also acknowledged. Well, you always get sued. I mean, everything you do, you get sued. I was sued on the travel ban, and we won. I was sued on a lot of things, and we won. So we'll see. Yeah, probably we get sued, but uh, people feel that we can do it. And we're expecting it to get challenged in court pretty quickly. More with Lee after a quick break. From nasty malware and ups, all online threats or online security problems. Check that out, right? I don't know. Brain trust at the cut. Lee, a few weeks ago in an episode titled Stimulating America, I talked to our colleague Matthew Iglesias about the relief Congress was working on, the Republicans' version and the Democrats' version. What happened to those plans? Unfortunately, Democrats and Republicans are in pretty much the same place they were in when you all had that conversation. They've been at a roadblock over what they'd like to see in a stimulus for almost two weeks at this point. Uh, The coronavirus is certainly not over. It's still a, an enormous problem. It's still affecting communities all across uh, the country. And I think the American people would like to see us working together and getting an outcome like we did back in uh, March and April. We talked about the sort of disagreement between Democrats and Republicans, the $2 trillion disagreement on how much money to spend to stimulate the United States. Um, what were the major sticking points in the debate between Democrats and Republicans over that $2 trillion? There are a couple big provisions. 
the first of which is money for state and local governments, which Democrats and Republicans have disagreed on for a long time. Democrats think that states and local governments need more money right now in order to simply cover public services because they've seen such huge declines in tax revenue. To do that, we must act boldly to support state and local entities to address coronavirus-related outliers outlays and lost revenue due to the coronavirus. We all know that we must put more money in the pockets of the American people. This is not only necessary for their survival, but it is also a stimulus to the economy. But Republicans think that offering this money would help states address budget shortfalls that they might have been experiencing even before the pandemic, so they're resistant to this idea. They want to bail out cities and states that have done a bad job over a long period of time. Nothing to do with coronavirus or China virus or whatever you want to call it. The second issue is this question of how much more unemployment insurance um, the government wants to continue funding for people. In the CARES Act, they included an additional $600 a week that the federal government would cover for people, and Democrats want to keep that going through the end of next January. What do the Republicans and the White House have against working families in our country? that they would begrudge them $600 of well, absolutely necessary sustenance. Republicans, however, think that's too much money and they want to um, reduce the weekly amount to about $200 and then ultimately pay people what would amount to 70% of their pre-existing wages before the pandemic. When you pay people more not to work than they would get working, what do you expect? people will not work. And that question continues to be a big issue moving forward. What are the arguments that Republicans are making opposing the Democrats, you know, obviously much more liberal spending plan? The Republicans are basically saying that right now our debt is already too high. And if we're going to talk about a $3 trillion package, that's just a sizable amount to add to the debt. I think that concern is something that a lot of people do have, but it's outweighed by the fact that we really need this money right now and that people really need support as businesses are closed and as many places have been forced to shutter because of public health restrictions. Um, so that is one big piece of why you see a larger number of Republicans increasingly opposing any more stimulus at all. As it's written to my, right now, I'm not only a no, I'm a hell no. And, and sadly, I think this is envisioned as an opening gambit. We, everyone expects the Democrats to come back with a huge wish list of spending. Some of the most vocal members doing this have been Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, and Ben Sass. Um, they've all really argued that this is unsustainable, and a lot of people see it as them positioning themselves um, for the future as people who continue to stand for fiscal conservatism, a key tenet that the Republican Party has long used to you know, say it's a defining quality for them. I'm very upset with my colleagues. They went eight years. They should apologize now to President Obama for complaining that he was spending and borrowing too much. He was a piker compared to their borrowing that they're doing now. So, yes, these Republicans, you know, they should have to apologize and they should, by law, be forbidden from ever saying that they're fiscally conservative. How much water does that argument carry with the American people? I mean, obviously, the idea of going further trillions of dollars further into debt isn't appealing to the average person but i just wonder generally how americans are weighing that against say not having enough money for rent or not having enough money to provide for their families in this moment it doesn't feel like it's carrying a ton of water with voters who are concerned about a lot of the things that you mentioned. For Republicans, there is a contingent of their base, which is more conservative, that we expect to probably weigh uh, fiscal conservatism as a key part of why they're supporting certain lawmakers. So for that small group of people, um, I think one poll found that it was 33 percent of Republican voters. The issue of the debt does seem to surpass maybe other current economic concerns that people are seeing. But for by and large, for the most part, it's not an issue that most voters are as concerned about as um, the immediate problems they're facing themselves. Hmm. 
how are the sort of debates playing out politically for each party? I mean, Democrats want to give more money, I imagine, to all of the states, regardless of whether they're blue or red or purple. Republicans are saying no. Democrats want to give the same amount of money to all Americans, regardless of party affiliation. Republicans are saying no. Are each party's constituents on board with each party's positions? At this point, most uh, constituents in both parties are supportive of what Democrats are pushing. When you look at polling, an overwhelming majority across party lines is interested in more stimulus, is supportive of more unemployment insurance, and the larger political fallout that we can expect to see from this, at least in the short term, is probably going to hurt Republicans more because they are the party in power in the White House and also the party in power in the Senate as well. You're saying it being an election year, this fight over stimulus could have some election year implications? That's right, yes. Um, Especially for Republicans in battleground states, stimulus could ultimately be an issue that tips over swing voters who are unhappy with how they've handled this whole process. Which states are we talking about here? Shout out some names. Yeah, uh, uh, some of the states I think that are going to sound really familiar to people, um, including Maine, Arizona, um, North Carolina, and Colorado, are just a few of the places where you see current incumbent Republicans who are very vulnerable and concerned that the ongoing issues with the economy and the lack of action from Congress to address it are going to be held against them in November. What are the senators representing those states saying? Are they... Are they on board with the president's executive orders? Are they saying we need to have more conversations with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer? They have uh, tried to propose some of their own efforts to indicate that they're getting something done. Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Martha McSally, uh, they're talking about either an 80% wage replacement for states or a declining amount, $500 a week in August, $400 in September, $300 in October. That would be more generous than what Republicans have proposed. Um, And additionally, they have similarly taken that line of trying to call out Democrats for being the ones they see as obstructing the process, even though Democrats have said that they passed their own stimulus months ago. um, So it's not on them at this point. And all told, with, with the president's executive orders and the continuing fight in Congress over how to spend this money and how much money to spend and the legal challenges you said that we're all but sure to see in the coming days. I mean, where does this leave all of those Americans who are struggling? I mean, are they getting zero additional unemployment insurance right now from the federal government? And if so, how long will that last? Yes, right now what we're seeing is people receiving the standard unemployment benefit that they'd get without any federal addition, and that's a huge range. The average amount is about $370 um, nationwide, but states actually implement the system themselves, so um, it can vary. In Oklahoma, for example, the average is around $44, which is a lot less, Um, and so people are seeing that hit immediately. Um, And they're basically in a holding period until Congress figures something out and until any of the effects we talked about from Trump's executive orders actually take place. And when might that be? I mean, when does that go into effect, if at all? It is really unclear at this point, and I think that's why there is so much criticism of Trump's actions. We don't know when that's going to happen. And the expectation from experts is because his version of unemployment insurance is supposed to require setting up a whole new system. It really could be weeks and even months until the next steps are, you know, fully taken. So people are just going to have to, what, maintain until then? Right, yeah. That is the, I think the worst part of all of this is the expectation is just for people to hold out until they get any more update on that. Lizo reports on Congress for Vox. She'll have updates for you at Vox.com as soon as we have them. I'm Sean Ramos for them. It's Today Explained.
our, our original, uh, the original, aka Goddess, whose name I'm drawing a blank on, uh, Chapman Rice will come. There you in. go. Damn. Yeah, see, you'll I hear, let you do, you'll hear I the intro thing, like, music don't, coming in. Don't help him. Don't help him. He can yeah, do it. Yeah, he exactly. can do it. And you did. That's, and that's how like I am with said. my four year old. Yeah. You gotta just, like just let him let him answer it on his own, and then he'll he'll have something to feel proud about, uh, mm-hmm. which is also what the doctor told you. Yep. Uh, you gotta give him some esteemable actions to give him to help him build self esteem. <laughs> uh, so just make him think uh, he got that. Okay, who's you this for now? Chapman you or me? On the, <laughs> on the screen. Uh, anyways, we are thrilled to be joined in our third seat by the hilarious, the talented. The brilliant Joel Monique. Oh my gosh, you honor me. Hi guys, what's How up? How are you doing? Welcome. So good to, oh man. So good yeah. to yeah. talk to you on mic. Morning. We talk so often off mic these days, but uh, yes. it's great to have you here. Often yeah. in a conference call with a yes. engaging or opening tune to just yeah. get everybody ready for the big call. It's coming. Oh yeah, exactly. Got oh, it. I usually, I, I usually interrupt everything everyone said and said, yeah, let's circle back to that, but uh, I wanted to, because um, I'm, like, I'm good yeah. at my job. So I was like, Do Jack, boss- I you how I was struggling in quarantine. <laughs> but, uh, Do your right. listeners know that you're, like, full boss? Like, are boss they aware mode. that you go into, like, boss mode outside of the show? I, oh, I wear yeah, a suit the second the show's on. over and my selfie is taken, I get on... Uh, an 80s <laughs> suit. It's boxy. It's got shoulder pads. Go Gordon uh, Gecko over here. Yeah, <laughs> slick back my hair. Uh, <laughs> Classic. Classic. Uh, uh, Joelle, how are you doing in quarantine? Uh, man, I got a hit show, so it's hard to complain, man. Uh, hey. I got good friends who... Things we're talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about how, tr- how fond Trump is of the executive order. Uh, you know, he's supposed to be the deal maker, but hasn't hasn't gone that well. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of important conversations that non-fascists are losing to fascists. I want to talk about uh, how there will probably be no results on election night. Not even like we won't be able to quite call it yet, but like we might not have any results, according to right. the nice. FEC commissioner. Uh, we're going to talk about Carol Baskin. We're going to check in with her, see what she has to say about the uh, WAP, WAP video. WAP. <laughs> she uh, got takes, man. You know, I'm glad. She sure glad. Do. Yeah, we have our you know very important media critic Carol Baskin to uh, you know step into the fray. <laughs> Does it have something to do with the fact that Kylie was rocking the leopard print? You'll see. We'll okay. get to it. You All know, right. Carol's got that. She has thoughts on, you know, the verses. She thought Ooh. Megan could have probably put a little more time into her verse, apparently. Yeah. Uh, little she had a lot of takes. The, little look yeah. behind the curtain. Miles is our Carol Baskin correspondent. He, yeah. He has his uh, ear to the streets on that beat. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about Disney uh, and how their numbers have looked since they reopened. Uh, Mount Rushmore and what that's going to look like after Trump wins the 2020 election. All of that. Plenty more. Oh. But first... Joelle, what is something from your search history that is revealing about who you are? Yeah, uh, H.P. Lovecraft is all up in that bee. I'm getting ready for Lovecraft Country, which is a black reimagining of a lot of H.P. Lovecraft stories set in uh, the American South. And Misha Green, who you may know from the slave show that was on UPN on something. Oh, my goodness. Underground? It's Yes, thank you. Uh, it's right there. Uh, yeah, so Misha Green did Underground. She is amazing. Black female showrunner, been working in the industry for a long time, written on some of your favorite shows. Uh, I think she got her start on Breaking Bad, if memory serves. Super awesome human. It teamed up with Jordan Peele to do this horror anthology series. I'm covering it for the AV Club, so I've been, like, trying to become, um, like, an H.P. Lovecraft historian before the show drops on Sunday, which has been... A daunting experience, but a lot of fun. Uh, luckily, audiobooks is available, so I don't have to actually read all the books. I can read them through my ears, uh, mm-hmm. which is much faster and easier to take notes that way. And uh, kind of really enjoying the experience. Uh, besides his racist history and past, right, which, you know, I'm sure the show, <laughs> yeah. the show is definitely going to take on it. Um, the man could write a book, man. It, all of his stuff comes from like a scientific journalist sort of like focus and so it's all like deep and dark and scary which is definitely my vibe um and i've been reading a lot of like mary shelley before this and so it's kind of interesting to get back into like the horror masters the originators and see what that's about yeah. when i heard her say that 
this is like Get Out meets Lost, or that Get Out and Lost <gasps> made this possible, I was like, yes, please, I will be doing that. Yeah. My um, goosebumps really, can... just shot off my arm. <laughs> I can tell you've seen the first two episodes, and whoa, it's so good. I'm it's really so good. It so yeah, far. people are saying it's so great. I'm excited. Um, <laughs> what's the other HBO show that's just coming to an end? That is, there's like oh, so much. Oh, Mason. Yeah, is that good? Oh, H. Jack. It's so good. Matthew Reese, who uh, people might know as lead from The Americans. Uh, plays the saddest man in the world. <laughs> Just a sad guy making his way through L.A. So very relatable. Um, but also it's got, like, you know, TV you used to have the rule where you like, don't show the dead baby. If a baby dies, it's just, like, a mother's scream or, like, empty oh, right. bastinet or something. So right. they were like, here's a ba- dead baby with its eyes sewn open, episode one. You're like, what the hell? Uh, and that's the level of, like, drama you start off with. And it's a little – some people didn't like episode one because it's, like, very dark. So much. But yeah. The emotional levels the show gets into by episode three are addictive. It's really, really good. Oof. Yeah. DB's in the pilot. Bam. <laughs> DB's. That, that is. We talk so much about dead babies around here uh, on a daily oh, no. zeitgeist that we just have to call them DB's. <laughs> like, just notes. A lot of people pitch podcasts. Like, this is not very interesting. It's very uh, violent. But yeah, it's interesting to always look at how like these remakes happen because I remember, like, the Perry Mason... Who was our Perry, Perry Mason, the the dude who had the white beard before? Like, because I knew it was a black and white show before the one in the '80s. Perry Mason doesn't oh. matter, but I'm just—it's interesting to see how there's like every, you know, that there these. This is another one of those uh, franchises that's like reiterating, but in like a Raymond like, Burr cool next right? level way. Is that yeah, Raymond Burr. And you, by our, you mean those of us who grew up in the 1950s? Is that- uh, no, I meant the what is it? 85. When did that one start? Uh, 19, was there... December first, nineteen eighty-five. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah for that ten one. years. Yeah, was that, that... decade of Perry Mason. This is a mini series. <laughs> so also, he series. came back. Oh, see, that's how ignorant I am about Perry Mason. I didn't even know it was Raymond Burr in the fucking fifties one. So, I knew nothing look. of Perry Mason <laughs> other than that when I saw one of the original Godzilla movies, uh, somebody was like, <laughs> "You know, that's Perry Mason," and I just thought that. Raymond Burr's name was Perry Mason. Um, and oh shit! All right, yeah. Well, shout so, out to the Raymond Burr. Check out to the shout out to the local film scholar me. Um, <laughs> but it's it's real good. They decided to reboot it, and it's like super dark and fucked up. And Joel, did you watch a uh, plot against America? We yes. Wait, is, is that the one with the the David Simon based on? Philip Roth's book about uh, if Lindbergh had like, yes was that yeah. any good? Whew. That one, it was okay. good. Like that's all I need to That's all I need Moving on. So what's something that's underrated? Really worked for me. Okay. Uh, what is something you think is overrated, Joel? Uh, ben Shapiro is overrated, except what? for when he does dramatic readings of rap Wait, songs. Who? Ben Shapiro? Ben Shapiro. Oh man. Yeah, the rapper, fucking Ben Rapiro. I mean, wow. wow. It's the best dramatic reading I've heard in a long time. Someone likened it to, like, a 93 uh, poetry slam reading, and I got that vibe. I definitely did. He was very much articulating his words in a certain way to try to make you feel like what you were hearing was ugly instead of maybe one of the most beautiful songs ever written. Now, right. this yeah. whole thing, his, like, analysis or whatever you want to call it, takedown of the mm. WAP video, what was his, like, gen- what's his end thesis, essentially? What is the reason that this video had to be put in front of his audience? He is mad because, like many parents, he believes that all adults should be uh, good representatives for children, as opposed to just the human beings that they are. Uh, you know, Cardi B and Megan Stallion are not necessarily uh, for your nine-year-old. You can shield them from <laughs> that level of entertainment. Yeah. But he was like, you know, this is what feminism is. This is what they want. And if you say anything else, they're going to get you. And it's like, Ben, I just want you to know that as a feminist, womanist person, I believe, fully that they have the right to do this, but that that should not be the definition of women. And that's all we are saying. <laughs> but, I mean, but there's some whores in this house. <laughs> what is going on? Okay, we'll just, let's just play a Should clip. we play a little bit of it? Yeah, because I... Like, I saw everybody getting their jokes off, and I knew he had done it, but actually hearing Ben Shapiro go through rap lyrics is really uh, its own thing. Here are some of the lyrics. You ready? 
Whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. Hold up. I said certified freak seven days a week. Wet ass P word. Make that pullout game weak. Yeah, you <laughs> effin with some wet ass P word. P word is female genitalia. Bring a bucket and a mop for this wet ass P word. Give me everything you got for this wet ass P word. Beat it up, N word. Catch a charge. Extra large and extra hard. Put this P word right in your face. Swipe your nose like a credit card. Hop on top, I wanna ride. I do a kegel while it's inside. Spit in a my kegel, mouth. Kegel, sir. Eyes. This P word is wet. Come take a dive. Um, come take a dive. Um, <laughs> hop on with your pullout game weak. Uh, mm. It was. It's funny because his face. He's almost like he's never heard someone's mouth get that nasty before. Right. So Hero has the kids, so this is proof that he's had sex at least as many times. Right. <laughs> like, Y'all are so mean and ridiculous, but also, uh, what a, oh man, I try to imagine being like, so bad, we want you to read all of these words out I mean, loud. I would have liked to have seen his very first reading of the lyrics. Right. He uh, probably fainted. Right. <laughs> like, he, he oh, this is what happened. He, no, okay, you know what happened. The, the video started trending on Twitter, so he looks at what's trending and he goes, okay, what's this? He checks it out. He cannot believe he sees it, but first, the first time he watches it, he fucking, he's loving it. He's like, oh, oh fuck yeah, yeah Megan. Oh my God, look at the titties are shooting water out from the fountain. <laughs> and then someone's like, hey, Ben, have you seen this video? He goes, what? No. What's going on? <laughs> what? Show me this. What is this? Whores in this house. There's some whores in this house. Pull up. I certified... Okay. What's up, guys? We did it. We listened to the news. We, we did our yoga. And we also listened to Today Explained. Great episode on Today Explained. All we need now is a uh, affirmation. Uh, to just keep drinking today or not to keep drinking today. Noodle, don't noodle. You're too worried about what once was and not what will be. Oh, shit. The chair just clicked. However, however, there's a saying, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, 